might be interested in charter schools just because you know they're an important part of American education reform right now. You've heard some things about them, maybe pro and con, and you're interested in knowing what the facts are. You might be interested in charter schools because you notice that there is a debate in politics about the importance of charter schools. In fact, a kind of funny thing about the current administration is that we have a new Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, terrific guy from the Chicago Public Schools, who signed a manifesto that was basically anti-charter schools and a manifesto that was pro-charter schools when he was, uh, when the uh, election campaigns were going on. So clearly it's, it's an issue and it's a, it's a political issue, so we'll try and learn about that. And then the other reason to be interested in charter schools has nothing to do with charter schools per se. It's going to turn out that charter schools are just some of the great innovators in American education. And even if you did not care about the fact that they were charter schools, you would probably want to try and learn from what they do well and what works for them and what does not work for them so well because those lessons apply essentially to all, uh, all schools. Okay, so that's where we're going to be going today, the promise and performance of charter schools. And I really thank the Show Me Institute and St. Louis University and the John Cook School of Business uh, for bringing me here. It's a pleasure to be here in St. Louis. Okay, so what the plan of campaign is, I'm going to tell you some background on charter schools and try to get you factually acquainted with them and make sure that we all know what it is that they do and do differently than what regular public schools do. Then we're going to talk about who attends charter schools. Now this is particularly important because many people have mm, an impression that different sorts of students attend charter schools than actually do and it will turn out to be important to know who attends them. Then we're going to look at how students who attend charter schools have their achievement affected. In other words, if you were to yank your child out of regular public school and send him to a charter school, what could you expect? And we're going to try and answer that question with the best evidence available, what's considered to be the gold standard of evidence in education policy research, and that is essentially random or lottery-based research. And I'll explain that to you in, in a moment. Then we're going to look at which charter schools perform best. This is an important question because they don't all perform the same and we can learn a lot from the schools that are the better performing schools. And then finally, we're going to try and look briefly at the question of whether we ought to think that charter schools are making the regular public schools better or worse. And the answer to this question really matters. And the reason it really matters is that the vast majority of students in the United States are in regular public schools. About 95% of the students who are in public schools are in regular public schools. So of course it matters what happens to them. If charter schools have a negative effect on them, that wouldn't be terrific because having a wonderful effect on 5% of the students in the public schools but a negative effect on the other 95% would not be an overall good situation. So we're going to talk about that as well. And then at the end, I would be glad to take questions, especially if you have questions that are related to local charter schools or something else, that, and you want to know how they relate to the more national scene. Okay, so let's talk about what charter schools are. They are fairly autonomous public schools. So they are public schools, but they have more autonomous management than, uh, than a regular public school does. And I think that's the way to think of the distinction. They have to obey most public regulations, everything to do with health and safety and non-discrimination, everything like that, but they get to make day-to-day -day management and curricular decisions. And that really does set them aside from regular public schools, which for instance, do not have as much flexibility in how they hire teachers, how they compensate teachers, how they assign teachers to classrooms, how they decide which textbooks to buy, all of those types of things. Those are the sorts of decisions that charter schools get to make for themselves. Now it's very convenient that charter school students have to take all of the same statewide exams as other regular public school students because that's what's going to allow us to find out how well they're, uh, they're doing for kids. Charter schools are fee-based, and by that I mean they're a little bit like private schools, except that the money comes from taxpayer funds. So in that way, they're a little bit like uh, vouchers that might go to a private school from, uh, from the public purse. Why does it matter that they are fee-based, that if I send my child to a charter school, the money follows my child? Well, it matters a lot because it means that if the charter school cannot attract students, it must close. Okay, that is the single 
most important reason to worry about their being fee-based. If they don't have demand, they don't have a budget, they don't exist. They shut down. So that sets them apart from a regular public school which would still be supported by its uh, tax base even if it didn't really have that much demand. Now the average U.S. charter school gets about 61% of the per pupil funding of a regular public school in the United States. So more than half but not much more than half. And you might wonder how it is that they manage to educate students with only 61% of the per pupil funding and that's a good question for the question period. If, um, because you'll realize pretty soon that it's, it might not be easy. Now here in uh, Missouri, what the charter schools get is a, about 100% of what the regular public schools get on average for operating funds. They do not get capital funds. So the difference between those two things is operating pays for your teachers and your textbooks, and capital funds would pay for your buildings. Okay. So they don't get 100%, but they get 100% of the operating funds. Charter schools are not allowed to select their students. They're not allowed to interview them, um, test them, make them fill out onerous applications that would eliminate uh, some students who didn't qualify on certain grounds. Instead, they usually have very minimal applications, often sort of postcard size, and they'll hold lotteries among their applicants if they have more applicants than they have places. This also turns out to be a convenient fact. The vast majority of charter schools in the United States are oversubscribed. They have more applicants than they have uh, students, and that will actually help us evaluate them well. And then finally, charter schools are governed in a way that's much more like a private companies or a nonprofit. If you, uh, those of you who know universities well will recognize that some of this looks more like universities or a firm sort of uh, governance structure. So the first line of, def or the first line of, uh, of governance for a charter school is the parents. The parents don't like the school, the parents leave. That's kind of like shareholders leaving the shares of a firm if they don't want to own it anymore because they don't think the firm is doing a good job. So, Parents are probably the single most important part of governance. They also have a board of trustees, which is very much like the board of a firm or the board of a university that can replace the school's head. It can decide that their teacher policies are wrong, all kinds of things like that. They can come in and try and influence uh, what the school is doing, and they meet on a regular basis. Then charter schools have authorizers. Here in St. Louis, most of the authorizers are local universities, including St. Louis University, but also some of the other universities in town. And the authorizers have the ability both to authorize the existence of a charter school and reauthorize it on a regular basis. And I think of them as sort of the third line of, of governance because if for some reason parents aren't making the charter school work and the board isn't making the charter school work, the authorizers are supposed to come in and say, look, you've got to change what you're doing. And that's, uh, that's the role of the authorizers there. And then finally, they participate in all of the state and federal accountability programs. So as I said, they have to take um, state tests, they have to participate in No Child Left Behind, they don't get out of any of that state or federal accountability. So four types of governance. Those are charter schools. The number of charter schools in the United States has grown extremely rapidly since 1990, essentially when there were zero in the U.S. and there were no charter schools allowed in any state. And uh, after 1990, they just zoomed up in number. And we now have about 4,600 charter schools in the United States. That sounds like a lot, and it certainly is a lot of progress if what you're doing is measuring it relative to 1990, but it's worth keeping in mind that we're still only talking about a few percent of American students being enrolled in charter schools. And charter schools will are disproportionately in some states, and within those states, they are disproportionately in inner city areas. So there are some areas where you might see quite a number of charter schools, St. Louis is one of them, but there are other parts of the United States where there would be just no penetration of charter schools at all. And you couldn't find a charter school around if you looked um, uphill and down Dale.